Thanks, everybody. Thank you, uh, JD and uh, panel and uh, Darcy and Alana for inviting me to talk a little bit about um, the process of ideation translation and realization as it relates to some of my recent projects. Um, so I'm, as an artist, I have an integrated practice. It focuses on uh, science and technology uh, themes and largely on humanistic encounters. Uh, with life sciences. I'm very interested in how uh, culture and institutional structures shape our understanding and our knowledge of uh, the history of science and the natural world. And my work is not focused on projects that are tied to some greater um, <coughs> biological or, or um, uh, medical necessity. I'm rather interested in transforming or extending the certainty of meaning of images and objects and how these new interpretations can emerge depending on how we uh, look at these objects and images. So let me start by uh, just showing you a couple of places where uh, ideation tends to happen for me. And I actually think for a lot of artists. I always call myself uh, sort of one of the most institutionalized people that I know because uh, my dependency on being in a research institution at this point is, is pretty profound. So New York lasers, these laser meetings where you actually have the opportunity to mix with other people is a terrific place, uh, kind of an incubator for ideas to flow. Uh, artists and labs programs tend to be places where great ideation happens, um, not only for artists that can uh, uh, connect in laboratory situations, but of course, uh, uh, because of the people that you tend to, to mix with in laboratory situations. Uh, artists in residence programs, of course, with these, you're visualizing something else. With these, you're you're, you yourself are being visualized. So uh, this is Dr. Cohen's lab at UCLA. It's, uh, uh, he runs a brain imaging institute there. Uh, for those of us, us in institutions, uh, these um, terrific team taught courses, uh, like this one that I'll be teaching uh, next year, The Art of Medicine, which is a, a medical humanities course uh, is a great incubator for ideas as well. Art Sci Fellows groups, um, I was fortunate enough to convince our Center for Entrepreneurship that the bringing together of artists, scientists, uh, and humanists on campus was in and of itself an entrepreneurial venture. So for those of you looking for funding, if you can make that case, you might get good money for this. Uh, this um, project culminated with a um, a terrific symposium that I co-organized at UCLA with Victoria Vesna called um, Art and the Brain. Um, I should also mention, and I think JD already mentioned it, that the New York lasers were developed in 2009 with uh, Ellen K. Levy and Victoria Vesna, and they are running about every six weeks, so if you're in New York, please come. So this presentation is going to be a real swift fly through several projects. I already know I have too many slides, but let me just begin with a project um, uh, and the history of physiognomy and eugenics, which, um, which prompted um, the, the uh, the kind of background for a project that I'm working on now. Um, years ago, I started a, uh, a prison arts program in a maximum security prison, and I became very interested in criminology and the history of criminology. And uh, many of you probably know that, that uh, all of these studies started in the 19th century and that they used to uh, measure people's heads, typically criminals' heads, to try and find a link between um, uh, violent or what was considered aberrant behavior and, uh, and the, the, the features, the micro and macro features of the head or the skull. And, um, you know, this research has carried up, you know, into the recent times and we are, um, you know, we've got scientists that are uh, trying to find um, other ways to find a compelling argument for the genetic and neurological components of criminal behavior, and of course it's very controversial. What you're seeing here are the um, prefrontal lobes of two brains. Um, the one on the left might be aberrant behavior. Of course, we can't tell uh, because it's not showing a lot of activity in the front of the brain where one would um, uh, where one would, would expect to see the presence of uh, conscience uh, uh, remorse and guilt, and um, on the right, of course, you see a lot of that. So, of course, this is controversial. You know, this is if you say that uh, aberrant behavior is biologically determined, it pardons the subject from wrongdoing potentially. But of course, if you say it's socially determined, then this also becomes a very political argument. All is to say, science has always been interested in that relationship between personality and the way our heads are shaped. So, I'm working on a project called the Mutable Archive. And the idea, the ideation for this project stems from um, 
an interpretation that fuses research with speculation. A uh, number of years ago, I was the Francis E. Wood Fellow at the College of Physicians, and I spent a lot of time with um, a collection that was put together by a comparative anatomist, and I photographed these post-mortem uh, inscriptions on heads with accompanying um, uh, archive cards to create um, a kind of a, of a memorial project to these, uh, to these individuals. And for the, the real realization of this project, which goes beyond the photograph, photographs, I've commissioned a series of um, writers, uh, scholars, historians, um, I will have a um, um, uh, opera singer. I will also have a um, spiritual medium to all write um, speculative biographies for the people in this uh, in this collection. And so, what this brings to to mind is that um, the conjecture and longing guides the way that we imagine these histories and the mutability of identity construction. So we'll just watch this for a couple of minutes. This is a, um, a script that was written by Buzz, artist Buzz Spector on the uh, Dutch suicide. Let me know if you need more. On September 15, 2014, a search for gray Dutch weather produced 67 results on Google. <coughs> Persistent frontal suture provides 11,500 hits. There were no results for pain associated with persistent frontal suture. But take away the quotes, and 3,910,000 results appear. In Acute and Chronic Pain Following Craniotomy, the journal article appearing as item three, the first page of this multitude. Doctors Gray and Mata note that craniotomies are generally thought to be less painful than other operations. Okay, so the the purpose of this project is really to, um, through this collection, restore a sense of personhood, individuality, and humanness uh, back into the individuals in this collection. I'm going to speed through these uh, photographs of uh, prosthetic devices uh, because I know that I have too many images to show you. So let me just show you a couple more projects to, to stay on task and on time here. Uh, this is a project that I did a few years ago for the Jordan Hall of Science um, at Notre Dame University. This is called the Eureka Project. And like quite a number of other artists, I was inspired by uh, one of Poe's, uh, Edgar Allan Poe's, uh, one of his last uh, pieces of writing called the Eureka, which was an essay on the material and the spiritual universe. It describes Poe's intuitive conception of the nature of the universe and surprisingly anticipates some of the key discoveries of the 20th century, uh, such as modern cosmology and the conception of black holes. Uh, Eureka was recently screened in the um, DVT, which is um, a high resolution, high fidelity, uh, projected 50 foot diameter dome space. And the work attempts to represent intangible forces, uh, both minuscule, social, cosmic, and probe a space between systematic operations and uh, unpredictability. So um, it's composed of five discrete video vignettes. And we can look at Eureka in relation to complex systems and as part of uh, the idea of the holon, which is an idea that interests me if, for those of you who have read Arthur Kessler and The Ghost in the Machine, which was authored in 67. A holon is both a whole and a part. It's a phenomenon with uh, a self-evolving, self-organizing system. And um, so these are some of the forms that it, you would see if you were in that DVT, which are quite um, dizzying. Let's see if I can get this to play. Sorry, hard for me to find the, um, the arrow. So in this brief excerpt, you see particles of an indeterminate scale, part and converge, disperse and coalesce, perhaps suggesting self-organization or a shift in flow due to ungovernable forces. So these particles seem to have a kind of collective agency or a herding lull, so they seem to fluctuate between uh, microscopic, cosmic, and, uh, um, and they almost seem to, um, um, to have a kind of, um, I don't know, the, at times the violent potential of mobs. So you're really not entirely sure what you're looking at, but you certainly get the sense that the universe has embedded codes. So this is a sort of playful 
uh, playful uh, project from that perspective, but with a serious message. Last project I'll show you is Dark Skies. Uh, this is a multimedia, cell, uh, multi sensory collaboration with the architectural firm Axiomi. Um, and also a sound designer I've worked with several times and a former student, Christopher Ottinger. And it is motivi motivated by the existence of light pollution, uh, defined by the International Dark Sky Association as a lot of different ways to say um, excessive amounts of obtrusive artificial light. And of course, we know that this impacts our sleeping patterns, our eating patterns, uh, uh, cell reproduction, um, nocturnal animals. You know, your hamsters don't do well if you keep the lights on. So the work takes um, on also an astronomical reference referring to remote places of hazy light. So you've probably seen this. In fact, I think we just saw it in the film that J JD just showed. Um, this is the world map showing you the highest concentrations of light, which um, I don't have the data on, but I have um, heard that the, these are also the highest concentrations of um, cancer rates. Um, I was inspired by the work of Paul Bacarita, who was attaching sensors to the tongue. Um, uh, this is what his research was based on, and um, allowing people who were actually um, sight impaired to, to see with the vibrations of the tongue. So there's a kind of sensory replacement. So in a kind of playful way, I started this project by um, uh, capturing a scanning electron a micrograph of a wild mouse taste bud. And here you see the translation of that taste bud into uh, 3D data sets, which were turned into CNC routed tiles. And the purpose being that the, t the tile was meant to be a kind of lenticular surface to produce uh, an installation. And um, so there was a lot of play with the different surfaces and what the, um, the human shadow looked like on those surfaces. And this is a close up of the, the tile itself. This is what the projection screen looks like. This is an eight by eight foot wall, but that was just the prototype. I'm planning to go much larger with this and then show you a little bit of this piece, which was installed at UCLA's ArtSci Gallery. And Mary saw that piece and wrote about it on her blog. Art and Shadows, right? So this piece has uh, directional video and directional sound. So there's a fully embodied experience uh, of the space. And uh, the raw files were taken at twilight, capturing sounds of creatures just as the kind of cr crepuscular skies were upon us. So you can see more of this video. Um, I'm now working also with Axiomi um, on a project that they've done major research in to develop a moss that is living in these architectural structures. And this is um, a very different kind of, of thing than simply um, a living wall because these are um, actually purification plants. And uh, Sung Ho Kim has worked with two plant biologists at Washington University to develop these walls. And so the next uh, phase of my work will involve these uh, living surfaces. And I guess I'll just close uh, by saying that um, I'm, again, that my uh, inspiration, um, the, I, the, the process of ideation, real, uh, translation, and realization um, <coughs> like most artists, is a very individual process. But whereas scientists would tend to measure and model things, as an artist, I'm trying to really contemplate how to transform, abstract, and extend. Um, I compose rather than decompose, let's say. And uh, uh, through the translation of scientific ideas, uh, my own work uh, you know, strives to, to uh, interpret rather than illustrate a scientific theory. So that's it. I hope I stayed on time. Thanks. Thank you.